Doesn't it look good up here? We're getting ready for VBS, and you never know what can happen in VBS. I'll always remember a little girl that brought her friend to VBS one year. I don't remember which year it was, but she was introducing uh, me to her friend. She said, here's my creature. <laughs> I'll always remember that. But we're going to have a great time um, this week, and... Uh, and to be praying for us if you're not a part of it, but you can be a part of it by just praying for us and praying for all the, the boys and girls. I want us to uh, continue in Hebrews chapter 13. We got through singing about the cross, and really that's a pivotal place for us in our text today. Uh, we ended in verse 8 uh, last week in chapter 13. We're, we're almost getting there to the end. Have you all noticed that? We're almost about to finish... Hebrews, some of you have uh, been wondering if it was ever going to happen. In July, I think the middle of July, it'll be actually three years since we started this book. And uh, I don't think I'm going to start a, a long book anytime soon again. Uh, but I'm praying about what we're going to do uh, after we leave this book. But we ended on verse uh, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that is a, a really great transitional statement to move us into the next text. It's almost like God knew what he was doing. That verse is speaking about the fact that Jesus is the same whether it's in the past. In other words, whatever he said in the past, it's still good. Nothing's changed. His promises, his word, same today, and those promises that he made are good forever. And um, that's a really good word for all of us because life is about change. And as you get older, things just are changing all the time. Um, your parts aren't working as good and all kinds of things happen. <clears throat> and so God is always there for us and, uh, and that never changes. It's a good word. So as we move from verse 8, we go to verse 9, and he says, Don't be carried about with various and strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have, been, have not profited those who have been occupied with them. If anybody knew anything about change, it was the, the congregation to whom the writer of Hebrews was addressing. Now, this, this letter was written, it's really a sermon is what it is, it's a 13-chapter sermon, um, was lit, written mid-60s, really maybe 66, 67, possibly even 68. So 30-plus years after Jesus died on the cross, rose again from the grave, and ascended into heaven. And there have been lots of changes for these people in particular up until this time, and, but they were about to uh, face um, an avalanche of change because in 70 A.D. Uh, the uh, temple in Jerusalem is going to be sacked and there will be over a million Jewish people who will be killed as Josephus um, writes to us historically about that event. And surely at this point they are, they know about this movement that's going on with the Jewish revolt and they know the, the pushback that's going to be coming from Rome. I'm sure they're feeling all of that. But uh, in addition to all that, they've had change and that change is noted in verse 9 because about the word what you've been eating for foods. So that's just a really, uh, he's just really trying to, to talk about their change from Judaism into Christianity. They grew up with this tradition of eating kosher foods and obeying all these rules and regulations from the book of Leviticus in particular in the Mosaic Law. And those were all good things. They were wonderful things. They were things that were prescribed by God. And many of these people in the congregation were probably former priests who served in the temple. Yet they came to know Messiah. They came to know Jesus. And so they had to defect. They had to come out of all of that 
because Judaism rejected Jesus as Messiah, as we know, they, the leadership crucified him. And, this, and at this time, it hadn't been that long. It's only been three decades since that time. So that, that rejection of Christianity, particularly if you're a Jew, is still prevalent. And you're, these people are being persecuted, and um, they're being ostracized. They're being ridiculed. And they probably still are having a desire for to going back and doing some of the things that they did uh, while they were in Judaism. Not that they're rejecting in any way their Christian faith, but, but they couldn't help but feel that some of those things were spiritual in value. I mean, they did them for all those years growing up. Now they don't do them anymore. Now they don't have the temple service. They don't go to the temple and do the sacrifices and all the other things, the incense and all those things. Now they meet in a home with a few people there in somebody's living room. And they pour over the Old Testament and whatever they had at this particular point in the New Testament. I didn't go back to check and see what they would have had, poss- what they possibly would have access to at this particular date in the first century. And so all the stuff that they knew was all gone. And so, but maybe there's some spiritual, and he says, no, there's no spiritual value in that. In chapter 9, he had already got through telling them the Mosaic law was obsolete. It was, it was, it was, it was there, it was a good thing, it was a tutor that brought us to Christ, but once we met Christ, we didn't need the shadow anymore. We have the reality. That's why all of the Ten Commandments are reiterated in the New Testament, except for one, and that's the one about the Sabbath. He talked about that in chapter 3 and chapter 4. We don't need to uh, follow a one-day prescription for rest during the calendar week when we have Christ who gives us rest 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and forever. We now rest in Him. We've ceased from our own works and we rest in what he did in his works. So that it's gone. So it's all a moot point. And he's still trying to drive that home with them about what really is a spiritual work that's pleasing before God. I mean, I mean really, that's, that's really what all of us want to know. I mean, we don't want to just be spinning our wheels. We don't really want to just be going through the motions and wasting time. You don't want to go through your whole Christian life and get to the end of it and go, man, I really missed the boat. I I thought I was serving God, and here I just wasn't doing much of it at all. That's... I think that's what he's trying to drive home with these guys and with us today. And so he spells out some things here, I think, that will help us identify possibly some concrete, specific things that really matter to God. And wouldn't you like to know that? I'd like to know that. You'd like to know that. And that's why God is writing these things to us. So let's see what he says. He says, this stuff, this being kosher, you know, avoiding shrimp and lobster, it just ain't the ticket anymore. There's a new law. It's called the law of Christ that the Apostle Paul wrote about in the book of Galatians. And this law is very different than the old law. The old law, all you have to do is break it once and you're guilty of the whole law. And you're under the curse. And you're in bondage. You're a slave. But in this law, when you meet Christ, since he's performed the law for you, you have liberty and freedom, and you're no longer a slave. You're now a son. That's a much better deal. That's the deal you want to live in. But what does that look like? I think that's what he's trying to paint a picture for, for us. So let's move on. He says, uh, we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. And he's not talking about the Lord's Supper, but he is talking about an altar. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Now he's going to to give an analogy here. Um, And he's going to talk about um, this altar that we as Christians have, which is much different than the altar that Judaism had. 
or the Jews had. Now he's going to reference not only the tabernacle, he's going to reference the temple. He's also going to reference the city of Jerusalem itself. And he's going to make a reference to the camp. Outside, he's going to talk about Jesus was died outside the camp. And this reference goes back to Leviticus chapter 16, which is the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement, when they sacrificed, um, um, when they made the atoning sacrifice, let me say it that way, they did not eat that sacrifice. What was done with that atoning sacrifice, atonement means to cover over, so their sins were covered over from one sin to the next, and then the next, and then the next, and the, the point was to come all the way to uh, Jesus on the cross. There he made final atonement. But the sacrifice, the atoning sacrifice, was not eaten by the priests. Many of the other sacrifices were eaten, but not this one. This one was taken outside the camp, and there it was burned. He's saying they don't have the same altar that we have. They did this on the altar. They made this atoning sacrifice on the altar. The altar that we have is not a physical altar. The altar is Jesus Christ as He died on the cross for us. That's the altar. They have no right to go there because they don't know the Lord. And so they're still doing all this priestly stuff in the Old Testament Mosaic law back at the temple because it was still in play for the next two, three, four years depending on when this letter was written. He says, so we have a different altar. Now this altar, which is Christ dying on the cross, that's, that's where he's going to help us in specificity to, to our Christian life, to find out what we are supposed to be about in pleasing God. So let's, let's move on. He says, for therefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered outside the gate. Now this, you know, this is a shocking statement to a Jewish person in the first century. You're talking about believing in a Messiah, believing in a man who died outside the camp, outside the gate gates of the city of Jerusalem. Outside the camp would be a reference to the tabernacle. Same kind of thought, just two different places and times. Why, why is that so? Well, in the Day of Atonement, the atoning sacrifice was taken outside the camp because all the sins of the people were placed on the sacrifice. This, this, this atoning sacrifice is not a holy thing, it's an unholy thing. It has become sin, and they've taken it outside of the camp and burned it there. And the priest that does that can't go back into the camp for quite a while because he's now unholy. He's now needs cleansing himself. And yet, what did they do with the Messiah? They took him away from the temple. They took him out of the city, outside the camp. And there they crucified him in an unholy place like tremendous disconnect man if you're a first century Jew trying to listen to this but that's exactly what happened and Jesus died in an unholy place and took all of our sins upon himself and there he died in an unholy place but in doing so he made us holy so th those are just kind of the facts the information that he's trying to give to reference where he's really going to go with us so he says something here. He says, since all this happened, because he's just not trying to give you facts and information, he said, um, therefore, verse 13, since Jesus suffered, therefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth. And that's an invitation. That's an invitational verse. God is inviting you to do something. So if I can use the phrase, if you want to camp out somewhere, this is the verse to camp out. When I, when I read the Psalms, I read one Psalm as I shared with you a day, and then 
I just want to pick one verse out of that psalm and kind of just think through that. I'll copy and paste it, put it in my journal. And then I just want to refer to that one verse as I go throughout my day. Because, you know, too much information is not good either. We've got to kind of narrow this thing down. And, and you want to find out, well, what is it God wants to say to me today? Well, here's what he wants to say to you today. Verse 13. Therefore, let us go forth to him. Now, where is he? He's outside the camp. What is he doing there? He's suffering and he's bearing his reproach. Now, God wants you to go outside the camp. So, we've got a, I got a little picture here. <clears throat> there we go. <clears throat> and uh, I think that'll, that little thing will go off. There we go. Maybe it'll do it here. There we go. So I got a picture. I just found this on the internet. But it really kind of said what I wanted it to say. Because um, it's not just about uh, Christ who's here at the cross. It's about these people right here. Who are these people? Well, it's probably Mary, his mother. Got some other Marys there, some other women. Got John there. Uh, and there's just some other people there. And they're there with Christ. <clears throat> now this is the place that he's inviting you to come. And what does that mean? What does that look like? Uh, there's a lot there. There's a lot we could talk about. Gosh, and I'm still, I'm just now thinking about this verse. I've never, till I came to this place, I was never really thinking about this verse or this invitation. What is Jesus doing here? He's, he is being ostracized. You know, the Pharisees are there too. And they're ridiculing him. Huh, he said he was God. Let him come down and save himself. They're, they're mocking him. The Roman soldiers are there, and, and they are gambling for his clothes. And Jesus is there, in spite of all that. And he's dying. Did he have to do that? Did anyone force him to do what he did? No, he's doing this. He volunteered himself for this. He chose to do this. He chose to be nailed to that cross and to suffer and to bear this reproach upon himself. And there, all of the sins of the whole world, God the Father placed on him. And while all that's going on, all these other people are making fun of him. And he is God. And he's been taken outside of this holy city. What the city has said is, you're not worthy to be crucified even within the town. So in other words, it's, it might look like uh, something like, this is Jerusalem and this is the temple and, and here's the gate. And they said, you're not worthy to be in here. We're taking you outside. And so if you're a Jewish Christian in the first century, in particular, these people, if they served in the temple and they were really involved. Here's what the writer is saying that God is inviting them to do. You know, this place in here, this place is safe. A lot of tradition, a lot of comfort in here. But God's calling you on the outside. Will you stand with him at the cross? Or will you be ashamed? What this place, I think... Um, really represents is a place to die. Jesus said something like this. He said, the man that tries to save his life shall lose it. And the man who loses his life shall save it. The whole picture of the cross is that Jesus laid down his life so that we might have life. Now, if we're going to follow Jesus, what should we do? Here's where that cross, that picture comes into play. If we're going to follow him, we must also lay down our life. 
This is the invitation. It is not an evangelistic invitation, I don't think. I think, because these people are already Christians. This is an invitation of discipleship. So if you're a Christian, if you already know the Lord, it's an invitation for you. God is saying, verse 13, therefore, since all these facts are true by him, let us, or he says, verse thir- therefore, let us go forth to him, let us go outside the camp, let us meet him there at the cross. As he laid down his life, I invite you, God says, to lay yours down. Now, again, we have to ask, well, what does that look like? What does that mean? I think there are just all kinds of different ways. Um, I had a little video. We, we don't have time to show it. I had a little video of a missionary with Gospel for Asia, and he goes in the mountains. I think it was Nepal. I can't remember exactly. And he goes with all these villages where people have not heard the gospel ever. They've never heard the name of Jesus. And so, and there are still tens of thousands of people, and he's the only one up there. But he's, he's going, and he's sharing the gospel. He's giving out tracts, gospel tracts and New Testaments. And he's got a little church that he started. Well, I think he's a good example. He's an illustration of somebody that's laid their life down. Well, so do you have to go to India and the mountains of Nepal to lay your life down? Is that what you have to do? No, that's just what I'm saying. There are all kinds of different colors in the rainbow. And so there are in the ways that we lay our life down for the Lord. Now, I think he kind of spells it out here for us. Look here. He kind of lets us know what this picture looks like of going outside the camp to where Jesus dies on the cross. He says, verse 14, for here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. So this person who's going to go out here and bear this ridicule and this reproach, who's willing to say, Lord, I'm willing to stand with you out here. I'm willing to get out of my comfort zone. I'm willing to even leave my tradition. Whatever it is that I need to to, to, to do, I'm willing to stand there with you. This person has a, uh, a view of life that this is not all there is to life, this, this earthly thing. They're saying, no, there's heaven. There's the Lord's will, the Lord's purpose. And so they have a futuristic uh, view. They, they, uh, they're thinking about the future. And Jesus, when he was on the earth, always trying to get his disciples, don't just think about the here and now, man. Think about the by and by. Think about building God's kingdom. That's why Jesus said, don't build treasure on earth, build it in heaven. So here's what he says. So they've got this, this thought that there's a whole lot more to life than what I can see with my physical eyes. So I'm going to need to make some good decisions. So verse 15, I think he spells it out for us here. Therefore, by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise of God, that is the fruit of our lips, give thank, giving thanks to his name. Do not forget, and, but do not forget, I'll we'll stop here, to do good and share for such sacrifices, God is well pleased. So I think that we can find <clears throat> some specifics here on what really matters to God so that we won't spin our wheels and waste our time. Okay, so he talks about the sacrifice of praise, and and then he even says, and we can do what in the next verse? That was in verse 13, 14, 15, and then he says, don't forget to do good and share, and share, and and what does he reference doing good and sharing? What does he reference that as? A what? A sacrifice. Doesn't he in that verse? Do you see it there? With such, what does it say? In other words, you're not spinning your wheels if you're doing this. That's what he's saying. This is what happens when you go outside the camp. When To stand there with the Lord means you're doing this kind of stuff here. That's, that's what he's saying. That's where we're going here. Okay? That's what this stuff means. Now, what does it mean to have a sacrifice of praise? <clears throat> now, we all been praising God 
Um, who sounded better, the men or the women when we were singing? <laughs> I heard men and then I heard women. Oh, well, you, you sounded good, okay? You sounded good. We were praising the Lord. We were in here singing, okay? That's not a sacrifice of praise. Now, that is praise. It's just not a sacrifice of praise. Now, what do you do when you sacrifice something? Now, when I was a little kid, we had Lent. And I thought I was really doing good by giving up bubble gum. <laughs> I didn't even like bubble gum. But... No, that, that's really not what we're talking about, you know. But the word, the, the, the meaning behind a sacrifice is you lose something, right? So, if you were an Old Testament Jew and you had a little baby lamb and it was time for you to make your sacrifice and you took your little baby lamb to the temple and they sacrificed your lamb, did they give your lamb back to you? No. You lost that little lamb. You lost something close to you. You might have lost a friend, a little pet. You walked home without him. Now, that was a sacrifice. That's why when, you know, in that Old Testament priesthood thing, all of that, it was the people of God were coming to the tabernacle. They were coming to the temple to make sacrifices. Those sacrifices were something, were things that they were giving as an offering to the Lord. Now, when you give something that is meaningful to you, to the Lord, that is the sacrifice of praise. You're losing something and someone else is gaining. Whether it be God or whether it be another individual. And so he says... Here's, here's what you want to be doing. You want to be doing good to others, and here's a word, sharing. That's a sacrifice of praise. Now, um, in school, I just got through working through five, chapter 5 on the Sermon of the Mount, uh, verse 33 to 48. Anyway, there were several things that uh, he spoke about, like, you know, when you get slapped on the cheek, turn the cheek. When somebody wants your shirt, give them your coat. Somebody wants to go a mile, walk a second with them. And, and as I was looking at all that, I realized that God was dealing with pride and uh, possessions and rights. And to lay your life down, as Jesus laid your life down, he was saying in the Sermon of the Mount, that if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to lay all these things down. You're going to have to say, and, and the slap on the cheek was not about war, it was about insult. The worst thing you could do to insult a Jewish man was to slap him on the cheek. And what does Jesus say you should do? If you're at the cross, if you're outside the camp, you'll turn your cheek. You'll lay down your pride. And then when it comes to your possessions, some people say, well, it's all mine. Some say, well, I'm going to give God 10% and the other 90% is mine. And then some say, no, it's all God's. He owns it all. I think the Old Testament says all the silver and gold is mine. And so when somebody has a need, we say, well, this is the Lord's money. I I'm going to let God work through me. I'm going to share with others. And then some will demand upon us certain things that may not be reasonable logic or logical. But we'll say, no, I've got my Christian testimony at stake and I want my light to shine. And so I'm going to lay down. I have a right to this, but I'm going to lay it down so that I might win this person to Christ. Now, all of those things I think look like being there at the cross where we I think these things are what Jesus had in mind at least in part when it talks about laying your life down as he did because that's exactly what he did the 
these sacrifices are sacrifices that where we give up something. So I think the Lord has in mind with those things in, in respect to those things, a couple different things, our time, our money, and our reactions to life, to those around us. And these would be right there. God is probably not calling you to be a missionary in the mountains of the Himalayas. But I believe He is inviting you to spend your time, some of your time, for Him. You know, I don't, somebody spent some time up here. You know? That, that's a sacrifice of praise. When you give some of your time, and you have 24 hours a day, seven days a week, how much are you willing to give of that to the Lord? You know what? That's up for you to decide. God is not going to get you in a headlock. He's not going to force you. What this is in this text is an invitation. God is inviting you to come, but He's not going to force you. He wants you to choose. And he's using the writer here to, to prod them and to get them to consider, to provoke them, to stir them up to good works, works that give praise to the Lord. A lot of people are going to spend some time this week. They could be doing something else, but they're going to be here helping kids. We could not have vacation Bible school if there weren't a bunch of adults and young people here who were willing to give their time. What can you do with your time? Can you write a letter? Just encouraging someone? Can you make a phone call? Can you make a hospital visit? No, the only person who's supposed to make hospital visits is the preacher. Did you know that you have liberty to do that? Feel free. <laughs> what about... Um, with your time sharing your faith. In other words, you're willing to stand there with Christ at the cross, and if somebody wants to ridicule you for sharing your faith, you're willing for, for somebody to do that because you are not ashamed to stand with Him. That's what baptism is all about, by the way. When somebody gets saved, they're coming out and they're saying publicly, I'm not ashamed to stand with Christ outside the gate. I'm willing to bear this reproach with him. Time. You can share. You can spend time in the New Testament, the Old Testament, praying for others. That is a sacrifice pleasing to God because you could have spent that time on, your own, on yourself, right? But when you decide to spend it on God, that is something that pleases him. That's a sacrifice of praise. And then your money, being generous, recognizing that God owns all of it. And why would you want to give? Because you would want to help others. You want to build the kingdom of God. That's a sacrifice, well-pleasing to the Lord. And then how you react, turning the cheek, going the extra mile, giving your shirt when somebody asks for your coat your most basic possession. I hope that you will think about camping out on verse 13. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Don't you want to be with Jesus wherever he is? Here's your chance. Make a decision today and go. Let's pray. Father, help us to continue as we leave this place now and as we leave to consider these things we've spoken about. The sacrifice of praise. 
standing with our Lord, willing to follow Him with our time, our resources, and our reactions. Knowing that life changes, but you, Lord, never change. Your promises are good now and forever. We praise your name today in word, but what we want to do is praise you with our actions, with the way we live our lives. In the areas we've mentioned, help us. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.